Chapter 37 is on communities and ecosystems. All right, so dining in. And when they say dining in here, they mean it literally. This is an example of a parasitic wasp. It um, comes to a caterpillar and literally, literally lays its eggs inside of the caterpillar, which then eats it from the inside and kills it as the eggs develop into larvae. And then there's another wasp, believe it or not, that can sense when this poor little caterpillar has one wasp egg in it, and it lays its eggs in to outcompete that wasp. And there's even a third one that does the same thing. So the one caterpillar can have three different kinds of larvae competing inside of it to eat it from the inside out. Isn't that gross? Okay. So, community structure and function depend on the interactions among organisms. So, when we look at community, it has to be something close enough where these organisms interact. And the example I gave you was an example of interactions. Uh, ecosystem structure and function depend on the interactions of the community with its abiotic environment. So, when we look at the difference between community and ecosystem, the main difference is ecosystems going to include things like the rocks, the weather, the soil, all kinds of stuff like that. A community, we're just looking at the living organisms and how they interact. All right, there's that poor caterpillar with a wasp laying its eggs inside of the caterpillar. A community includes all the organisms inhabiting a particular area. So a biological community is an assemblage of all the populations of organisms living close enough together for potential interaction. So whether we see them interacting or not, if they're living close enough together, they can be having an effect on each other, whether it's a direct effect or an indirect effect. All right, key characteristics of a community. We're going to look at species diversity. Is it a monocrop of just grapes everywhere, or are there different kinds of organisms? We're going to look at species richness, just the numbers of different kinds of organisms. And then we're going to look at relative abundance of each of these. So if you had one community that had five different organisms or five different kinds of plants, say, but one was super, super dominant, that would look different in relative abundance of another community with the same five plants, but if they were all equally dispersed in that uh, community. So relative abundance is how much of each you have. All right, we're going to look at the dominant species. Um, dominant species are going to be sort of your top predators. You're going to look at response to disturbances. So we can look at succession. It's called succession after a, a major disturbance, a fire, a volcano, how things come back. And then we can look at trophic structure, the feeding relationship among species. And trophic structure, you'll tend to have, again, the highest um, uh, predator will be at the top. That will be the, the highest consumer, and you'll have consumers under that and producers at the bottom. All right, so here are you looking at relative abundance. This picture is showing relative abundance of different types of flowers uh, in a field. And so if they're all equally dispersed, that looks different than a field that has all purple flowers and maybe one or two of the other kinds of things. Okay, competition can occur when a shared resource is limited. So if two different species are going for the same resource, you have competition. Interspecies competition may play a major role in structuring a community. So two species competing for the same limited resource, and that may inhibit growth of one or, or both species. So, um, you know, you can end up with the dominant species there, or you can end up with, uh, a case where both species are limited because the resources are limited. Okay? The competition, competitive exclusion principle, the two species cannot coexist in a community if their niches are identical. So niches are uh, how we look at how a, a species uses its biotic and abiotic resources. So a niche may be um, not only uh, where an animal lives, like a physical niche, um, but it can also be they eat a certain acorn or they eat a certain thing, and you generally will not have two identical types of animals. They will diversify 
to um, coexist. So they'll either evolve so that one uses resources differently, or sometimes one will go extinct. So you can have less competitive species will be driven to extinction um, or move, you know, local extinction will have to move out or um, the resource partitioning may evolve and that's when they decide to use resources differently not decide but they're forced into that situation all right so this is an example of um, competition and you have different kinds of barnacles here you have this one and this one uh, so uh, what you have is the tides here and so you have to have um, barnacles have to get immersed in water this one is able to stay out of the water longest so it only gets underwater when it's high tide and this species is a more aggressive species but it needs the water more so what ends up happening is this species is limited on how far down it can grow by where this one Ends. If you were to take away all these white barnacles, this species would just take over. It would love to go all the way down here, but this one just takes more resources more efficiently and doesn't allow that. So wherever this one ends, this one's stuck going above it. Now, if you take away the top species, the white ones will not grow up because they can't stay out of water that long. They just can't. All right, here you have two, two different lizards, and um, these ended up, they were taking similar ecological niches and they ended up diversifying. All right, predation leads to diverse adaptations in both predator and prey. Predation is an interaction between species in which predator kills and eats the prey. Adaptations of both tend to be refined through natural selection. So if you are the prey, you might have camouflage or you might have a chemical defense if you're a plant or um, maybe a poisonous insect and if you're the predator your adaptations are going to be things like moving faster you know a, a good eyesight and hearing all right that's a great that's a tree frog and uh, beautifully camouflaged all right another cute little froggy that one is uh, poisonous and so uh, advertises that essentially by the bright colors all right, so we have different kinds of mimicry, and the Batesian is a palatable species mimics an unpalatable model. So this is sort of like cheating. This is uh, a species that's going to look poisonous, but they're not really poisonous. And it will work if there's enough of the truly poisonous species um, that animals will learn not to eat them or won't try them. It doesn't work if you have a bunch of the cheats, essentially. If you have too many cheats, then animals will start to think it's okay. Then you have another kind call, called the malarian mimicry. And this is when two unpalatable species mimic each other. And the idea here is, even though they're both unpalatable and you think the animals are going to learn not to eat them, they learn faster not to eat them if they both look alike. All right, this is the malarian one here. This is, they both look alike and they're both un, um, unpalatable. All right, predation can maintain diversity in a community. And there's something called a keystone species. And a keystone species can exert strong control on community structures because of its specific ecological niche. And, you know, a lot of times we'll think of, okay, the top predator is a keystone species. It doesn't have to be the top predator. Often it can be because um, they certainly exert control on the community underneath them. But it can be something in the middle of uh, your food web. And if they have control over a certain area, they become a keystone species. So when we look at the predator, a keystone predator may maintain community diversity by reducing numbers of the strongest competitors. So you can see examples of that uh, with uh, sea otters. Uh, sea otters will eat a lot of sea urchin. And if you get rid of the sea otter, a bunch of these sea urchins will devour the kelp forest. And that actually reduces diversity. Uh, so you think a predator may not allow for diversity, but they actually can increase diversity by keeping control of a species that otherwise would just take over. 
uh, removal can cause major changes in the community dynamics. In the case of the sea otter, if you took it away, again, the sea urchins just go crazy and wipe out the kelp forest. All right, and there is... Um, and actually, they did a specific example of this, the first one ever did. They took sea stars, and they literally went out and removed them, and they found that what the sea stars ate, literally the barnacles ended up taking over that whole uh, tidal area. So there was an experiment where they went through and on purpose removed the sea stars to see what would happen. Okay, so this is an example of like a, a basic food web, right? So we have the, the kelp, the sea urchin, the sea otter, and the orca at the top. And we naturally think, well, the orca is going to be the keystone species. Really, in this case, the otter is more of a keystone species because the orca will eat different things. But if you get rid of that otter, again, the sea urchins will go crazy and uh, devour your kelp. Herbivores in the plants they eat have various adaptations. Herbivores are animals that eat plants or algae, and they have adaptations for locating and eating vegetation. So, you know, uh, they're meant to do that. They, you know, giraffe typically, right? They're going to eat out of the trees. They're going to be grazers. They're, they're going to have long necks. They're going to have something that allows them to eat vegetation. Plants evolve defenses against herbivores because plants don't necessarily want to get eaten. Um, so, and they can't run away, so they'll produce toxic chemicals, so poisons, or they'll have physical defenses like spines and thorns. Those are there to prevent animals from eating them. Okay, some herbivore plant interactions illustrate coevolution. That means they evolve together, um, and they have reciprocal evolutionary adaptations because, again, they evolve together. The change in one species acts as a new selection force on another species. All right, so an example of this is this little caterpillar. This plant is poisonous, but the caterpillar can, um, can actually eat this. And so what the plant did, because it was getting annoyed at getting eaten, it doesn't quite work with that way, but you get the idea, is it started producing sugar deposits that would feed the predators of the caterpillar. So... The caterpillar's eating it, and it said, well, I'll feed the predators to the caterpillar with sugar um, to encourage them come, to come and prey on this caterpillar. Okay, so symbiotic relationships help structure communities, and symbiotic relationships are interactions between two or more species that live in direct contact. So this isn't indirect competition for something. This is direct contact. Uh, parasitism is an example. Parasites live on or near the host, so that's direct contact. Parasites obtain nourishment at the expense of the host, and it, it includes pathogens that may inflict lethal harm on the host. So we're going to include things like uh, viruses, bacteria, and amoeba in this thing. Uh, in Australia, people had introduced rabbits, and they went crazy and bred like rabbits. Uh, and so what they ended up doing was introducing a virus into them to control the population because they just took over and were eating all the foliage out there. All right, commensalism is when one species benefits without significantly affecting the other. And there are few cases documented of this where you can see really no effect. One possible one is like when cattle graze, they'll stir up insects and the birds will go eat the insects and it probably has no effect on the cattle whatsoever. Uh, another one is mutualism. You'll see this more often where both partners benefit. Okay, and in this case we have um, the plant is supplying the ants with uh, little, uh, their sugary little ends to the leaves there and then the ants will farm and take care of this plant. Disturbance, it, uh, disturbance is a prominent feature of most communities. Disturbances are characteristics of most biological communities. So, a disturbance can be as simple as a tree falling in the forest and opening up some light where some new shrubs can come in, or it could be as big as firestorms, floods, and volcanoes, and anything else. Um, it's a damaged community. It removes organ organisms from it. And um, it alters the availability of resources. 
So if you look at my simple example of a tree, we don't think of that being a huge ecosystem, but for the local plant right there, if they have not been able to get a resource like light, the smaller plants in the forest, they will not grow without that. If you look at a really mature forest, a lot of times there's few shrubs around. Um, so if you get a disturbance, they can grow. Um, it can have positive effects. We usually think of disturbances as negative, but it opens up different resources and nature has evolved this way. All right, ecological secession is a transition in a community species uh, composition following a major disturbance. So here, think fire, volcano, big explosion. So when we look at primary succession, we're down to barren rock. We don't even have good soil. So the first things that are going to come in are lichen and stuff are going to start breaking down the soil, uh, breaking down the rock so you can get soil. Uh, if you look at secondary succession, it occurs after the disturbance has destroyed a community but left the soil intact. Or it can occur after the, the primary secession, after you have developed the soil, after it has eroded and you've had some lichen in there, you can get a secondary secession that way as well. Okay. So if you have a retreating glacier, you get different stages. Now, you're not just going to get a tree pop up the second that glacier retreats. The first seeds that are going to blow in are going to be small. They're going to be weeds. They're going to lock the soil in place. Uh, prevent runoff and that kind of thing and allow for the trees to move in slowly as those seeds come in slower. Um, and then you're going to start to get, um, you know, some forest with a few simple trees and then you're going to get a full mature forest eventually. But that goes through the different lines of secession. Okay, fire specialist Max Moritz discussed the role of fire in ecosystems. Uh, he studies fire in chaparral ecosystems. And, you know, for years we did full fire suppression thinking fire was bad. Turns out that fire can be good and some ecosystems really need it. Uh, it can be important for nutrient uh, cy cycling, creates conditions for gener uh, regeneration of some plants. Some plants really need it for the seed dispersal. Um, and so Dr. Morris hopes people can coexist. Uh, lovely picture. Alright, trophic structure is a key factor in community dynamics. Trophic structure is a pattern of feeding relationships consisting of several different levels. So we're going to go up the food chain. We're going to have the sequence of food transfer up the trophic levels. So think, you know, grass goes to cattle, goes to humans. Those are your trophic levels. Um, energy and nutrients move up. Okay, your producers are going to be autotrophs, and they're going to support the other trophic levels. So that's the plants on the land, and in water it's going to be so photosynthetic protists and cyanobacteria. But they will, they will be the main producers that are going to take the light energy and get it into the food chain. And then you're going to have the primary consumers. Those are the herbivores that eat the plants and algae. So that would be like the cattle. So... If you're looking on land, it could, the producers could be the grass, the primary consumers could be the cattle. Okay, the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary consumers eat the consumers from the level below them. So that would be us eating the cows. Uh, the detrivores or decomposers, same, same thing, uh, eat uh, dead things essentially. Uh, they can be animal scavengers, fungi, and prokaryotes. They derive energy from detritus produced at all trophic levels. And detritus is the organic material that's sort of dead stuff, whether it's organic waste or um, literally the, the dead bodies. All that will form the detritus. Um, decomposition is essential for recycling nutrients in the ecosystem. Okay, so here are your levels. You have producers, you have a plant on land, phytoplankton in the ocean. You have a grasshopper eating the plant, you have a mouse eating the grasshopper, a snake eating the mouse, and a hawk eating the snake. Every time you go up this level, you are losing energy. So the higher up you are, the fewer of, fewer of them you will see. Fewer hawks than mice, fewer um, mice than grasshoppers, and so on down the line. 
Food chains interconnect, forming food webs. A food web is a more realistic view of trophic structures. So not that straight up arrow we just saw. Um, they're going to be kind of pointing to different things because like the mouse doesn't just eat one thing. Consumers usually eat more than one type of food and each food is consumed by more than one type of consumer. So the grass isn't just consumed straight up by um, the grasshopper or whatever. It's going to be eaten by a variety of things. Okay. The arrows always point up. They're pointing in the direction of energy and nutrient flow. So I've seen people reverse them and that's wrong. You want to point from the producers up to the consumers. So you can follow these and, you know, you can take some time and follow these. But the idea is that the, the energy and the nutrients start at the production level and they end up at the consumer and ultimately the the tertiary or quaternary consumer at the top. The ecosystem ecology emphasizes energy flow and chemical cycling. An ecosystem consists of all the organisms in a community and the abiotic factors with which they interact. Ecosystem dynamics involve two processes, energy flow through the components of the ecosystem and chemical cycling within the ecosystem. So the energy is actually going to get lost through heat, but the chemicals cycle because they don't disappear. We just keep reusing them. All right, so here you have energy flow. This is just a, a graphic diagram, but I kind of like it from the last slide. You have energy coming in here. It comes in, and ultimately you lose it through heat loss. All right, but the chemicals just move around, whether it's carbon or nitrogen or phosphorus, they, they just move around. Primary production sets the energy budget for the ecosystem. So if you don't have a, a lot of primary producers, you can't have a lot of anything else. But if you have a nice green area, you'll have more life. Primary production is the amount of solar energy converted by producers to chemical energy in biomass. So that is taking you know, basic photosynthesis here. We're taking carbon dioxide, taking light, and we're making sugars and things, and th those that's chemical energy is the sugar, chemical bonds. The biomass is the amount of organic material in an ecosystem. Net primary production is the amount of biomass produced minus the amount used by produces, producers in cellular respiration. And this is why you lose some every single time. We're not completely efficient things. We don't pass on the amount that we take in. All right, and this varies greatly among ecosystems. So this is sort of the um, productivity of each different kind of ecosystem you see here. An open ocean is pretty barren, uh, about as productive as a uh, desert. There's not a lot going on there. But if you look at an estuary or if you look where there's algae beds, there's a lot of life, a lot of production, a lot of photosynthesis. Um, cultivated land, you'll notice, is about as productive as grassland. And that might seem a little low, but it actually used to be lower back in the 80s. It was about as productive as open ocean, so we've gotten better at this. Um, and then tropical rainforests are obviously very, very productive, same as the algae beds and coral reefs. There's, there's a lot of life going on there. There's a lot of primary producers. Energy supply limits the length of food chains because you're going to lose energy every time you go up. We can't have things that eat things that eat things that eat things all the way up, you know, 10, 20 times because only about 10% of the energy stored at each level is available to the next level. The rest of it's lost. So when we look at a pyramid of production, it shows loss of energy from producer to the higher trophic levels. And the amount of energy available to top level consumers is relatively small. That's why it's a pyramid. Most food chains only have three to five levels. Okay, so here's your lovely pyramid. You have the producers. This is uh, an energy pyramid. You have 10,000 kilocalories, which is also just food calories, plain calories at the bottom level with the plants. Then you have a thousand calories for uh, worth of grasshoppers. So if, if you had 10,000 calories worth of plants, that could only support 
and produce a thousand calories worth of grasshoppers, which is what the mouse is going to eat. There are only going to be a hundred calories worth of them. And then the snake is only going to be 10 calories available to them. All right. So then if the, the hawk eats the snake, they're only getting 10 calories. So you have to have a lot of grass to support one hawk, which is what we see in nature. A production pyramid explains why meat is a luxury for humans. All right, so if you eat meat or fish, you're at the tertiary or quaternary levels of consumer. We're not eating the, the grass itself. Humans eating grain have 10 times more energy available when they pr process the same amount of grain through meat. So if you were to eat the corn directly, you would get more calories than if you fed the corn to a cow and then ate the cow. Although I might argue the cow tastes better, but whatever. Um, using land to raise animals consumes more resources than using land to cultivate crops. So here's the difference. If you eat the corn directly, you would be on the left side. If you ate the cow that ate the corn, you're on the right side and you have less calories available to you. All right, chemicals are recycled between organic matter and abiotic uh, reservoirs. So geochemical cycles, um, they cycled nutrients through biotic and abiotic components. And it can be local or global. So an uh, example of this, like carbon dioxide is abiotic, um, but we incorporate it into that carbon carbon into our bodies and it's biotic. So we can cycle things through the atmosphere. The atmosphere is not a biotic thing. It's abiotic, but it can hold the nutrients. All right. So here you have nutrients available to pr producers, consumers, detrivores, and abiotic uh, reservoirs. What you need to notice is basically the nutrients don't go away. They stay on earth and just move around. Okay. Water cycle moves through the biosphere in a global cycle. So solar energy drives the global water cycle. Why? It heats up the water, it evaporates, and then it falls back to Earth as rain. Also cleans the water when it does that. Yay. Transpiration is when plant, uh, plants or animals or anything exhale, or, or the transpiration is going to be the plants uh, releasing water into the atmosphere. It's similar in effect as evaporation, but what we have found is uh, if you cut down the forest, you can actually change the weather cycle because you're not having a forest transpiring the water into the atmosphere. So it's actually a more efficient way of doing it than just plain old evaporation. Um, and there are uh, good examples of that. Okay, water cycles between the land, oceans, and atmosphere. Forest destruction and irrigation affect the water cycle. All right, so always good to start with, um, I would say, evaporation from dinosaur pee. But if you start here, you go with evaporation. Evaporation is in taking water up to the clouds. It can precipitate over land. Um, it, evaporation from the ocean, it can precipitate over land. And it will go through the rocks, and you can also have groundwater running through. So one key thing to think about here is that there's no new water on the planet. The water that's here has been here for billions of years. It just gets moved around. All right, the carbon cycle depends on photosynthesis and respiration. Carbon cycles through the atmosphere, fossil fuels, and dissolved carbon in oceans. So taken from the atmosphere by photosynthesis, so that's where plant grabs the carbon dioxide, turns it into organic molecules, also known as sugar, and um, those organic molecules move through, like we can eat the sugar or whatever, the plant can keep the sugar. It either dies or we die or um, excrete it out. And then the detrivores get to it and return it to the atmosphere by cellular respiration. It can go that way. Um, it can either re also return as things decompose or if you burn the wood or the fossil fuels, you will be releasing that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as well. Um, or releasing it, I should say, faster, because if the wood decomposes, it can release it as well. But if you burn it, it's more instantaneous. All right, here's your carbon cycle. So carbon in the atmosphere, carbon sinks, what we call carbon sinks, where we can kind of lock carbon up. 
are in forests. You can kind of lock it up in um, things that have died and haven't released the carbon yet. If it's locked in, you know, peat moss and that kind of stuff, you can keep it locked there. Uh, and then it can be released into the atmosphere by us exhaling and by us burning fossil fuels and wood. All right, the nitrogen cycles relies heavily on bacteria. Uh, that is because plants cannot take nitrogen straight out of the atmosphere. So soil bacteria convert nitrogen to a usable form for the plants, and those usable forms are either ammonia or nitrate. Some ammonia and nitrate are made um, available by chemical reactions in the atmosphere, but it's really not enough for the plants. It's mostly going to be through bacteria. Human activity is altering the nitrogen cycle. Uh, sewage treatment and fertilization alters the nitrogen cycle because that's nitrogen waste products. All right, so here's your nitrogen cycle. You have uh, your nitrogen-fixing bacteria that make it available to the trees or the plants, which can be eaten, and then um, when the animal excretes, it's giving off nitrogen in its waste product. It'll go back into the cycle that way. Okay, the phosphorus cycle depends on the weathering of rock. So we need phosphorus. You need to think phosphate as in ATP. You have to have phosphorus. It's a key thing. Um, so phosphorus and other soil minerals are recycled locally. The weathering of the rock adds the phosphate to the soil. So it's a slow process that makes the amount of phosphorus available to plants low. What this means is that phosphorus is also almost always considering a limiting factor. Like you can only get so much growth because you only have so much phosphorus. If you add phosphates to the soil, you can increase the growth. Human activities has created phosphate pollution of water. And, and why do you think it, it's bad? Well, sometimes we don't want huge algae blooms and a ton of growth in certain areas. It's actually considered a form of pollution. Okay, so here's your phosphorus cycle. Um, locked up in walk, rocks, so the weathering of rocks um, and the geological uplifting of rocks will, will release that into the water. Um, plants can uptake it. Decomposers can release it again. Uh, animals will eat it and then decompose. Ecosystem altercation can upset chemical cycling. So the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest is a long-term study of nutrient cycling. And what they wanted to do was have some natural conditions and look at water loss balance between runoff and transpiration and evaporation, right? Keep everything kind of balanced. And then they were going to look and see what was the limiting factor in, in algae blooms. And what they found is that they could add um, carbon or they could add nitrogen and whatever. But when they added phosphorus, they got the algae bloom, showing that that is very often the limiting factor. Okay, so when we log or spray a watershed and, you know, remove the trees, um, you're going to find the runoff increases 30 to 40 percent, and that's because there's no roots that are absorbing the water. It, the net loss of nutrients, it becomes huge, and again, the roots normally lock the soil in place, and then the nitrate concentration increases with 60 times greater. So imagine, you know, there's no trees and the water, it's raining, there's no roots to grab onto the nitrate and soil, so it all basically washes into the creek below it. Other long-term findings are acid precipitation has resulted in calcium loss. It will dissolve calciums. Forest plants are not adding new growth because of calcium deficiencies. So here's an example, and in this example, you can see it's been logged. One, it's not coming back, but if you look at the picture, you can see the runoff, the little sort of veins of creeks coming down where it's the water's taking the soil with it. All right, so if you have deforestation and you have nitrogen concentration and runoff, you can see uh, it's just hugely different, right? Uh, with, with the trees, it's very low, and when you've deforested, it's insanely high. So David Schindler talks about the effects of nutrients on freshwater ecosystems. And often we think, well, nutrients are good. But ecosystems are often limited by nutrients. And we don't necessarily want huge algae blooms. And we don't want tons of stuff growing. Imagine Lake Tahoe. It's clear. It's beautiful. 
it's clean, you dump a bunch of nutrients in it, and it's just going to be a gross algae mess. Um, so when we look at nutrient runoff from agricultural land and stuff and livestock into fresh water, you can get this excessive algae growth. When we talk about this cultural eutrophication, that just means like way too many nutrients, it's too many nutrients, it actually is going to reduce um, species diversity because these blooms can choke out other things and it harms water quality. So here's an example you can see on the right and the left you actually end up having a bloom and this is where they've added the phosphorus.